All right, let's get started. We have 45 minutes to cover 39 slides. Tremendous amount of uh, material, and I hope you'll find this uh, very exciting, very interesting, and actionable towards the end of it. What I'm gonna do is, in this presentation, first I'm gonna give you some background about myself, about what is Jaguar Analytics, and then we're gonna have some actual specific trade ideas for you to take home that you can execute first thing in the morning on Monday when the market opens. I am the founder and the chief investment officer of Jaguar Analytics. Some background about myself, graduated from Michigan State, bachelor's, master's, and then moved to Chicago in 2003 and started working as a junior auditor in Deloitte and Touche that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. I was in Deloitte only for a couple years before I realized that accounting wasn't going to, me, going to be for me for a long time. I had to move on to better, more important things in life than do the accounting. So I went and joined uh, the second largest management consulting firm in the country called Alvarez and Marcel and basically became what we used to call ourselves doctors to sick companies. Put it differently, I was a restructuring advisor to middle market clients anywhere from $200 million up to two to $3 billion companies. These were financially distressed companies that, were, that would either hire us directly or their creditors would hire us to go and fix things up. So we would go in as management consultants, we will operationally fix things around, we will prepare long-term and short-term financial, sta financial statement projections for the companies, often helping the company through tough times financially. That requires sometimes negotiating on their behalf with the banks about their covenants, sometimes that required firing people, sometimes that required actually throwing the company into bankruptcy. I went to the Delaware Bankruptcy Court 16 times in over the course of two years. Worked on some of the largest engagements, including Blockbuster, Video Rental, you guys probably remember that one, right? Used to exist one day. Yeah. <laughs> um, a few other ones, um, some in Chicago, but basically all over the, all over the country, mostly in the Northeast and, uh, and, the mid and the Middle West. We had a different office on the South and the, and the West side um, that I didn't really have as much to go as other places. Did that for a couple years, rose through the ranks very fast. Two weeks after I was promoted to the vice president position at a and I basically quit my position voluntarily in uh, January 2009. Only because it occurred to me at that point that there was never going to be a better opportunity to go all in in the stock market ever in the history. Now, I had been trading on the side for a very long time, on my own, as well as management, uh, managing some money for my family, as well as some very close friends, going all the way back to freshman, sophomore year in college. But that was the first time in January 2009 when I took the plunge and went all in. Started on my own. In 2010, I wrote a business proposal, and I sent it to John and Pete Nigerian of Option Master that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He'll be here later today. And I sent this note, this proposal, I sent it to Pete and I said, I have an idea. Let me come in to your website and start a brand new subscription product. I will be 100% in charge of all the research and trade ideas. Your job is to go sell it. You have a very well established name in the community. He called me up the very next day and said, let's come to my office. That was Pete Nigerian. And then for three months of nonstop discussions, negotiation, we finally cut a deal. In August 2010, we started a brand new subscription product on Option Master that I ran for six years. In 2016, it was the highest grossing service on Option Master website. At that point, the company was sold first to Options House, and then Options House was sold to E-Trade, and so everybody sort of just went their own ways. I had the opportunity to continue to work with E-Trade, but I didn't want to. So in 2016, I separated, and I started on my own with my partner, with my friend that's back over there, Tom Joy, who's the CEO of the firm. And we founded Jaguar Analytics in May 2016. And here we are, continuing to do the same thing. Continue to hire the talent, continue to build out the product, and continue to gain more and more clients as a result. 
Our average clients have been with us for 3.7 years. Many of the clients that were with us with Option Master, they came over, they continue to be with us. Many of them actually go all the way back to 2011 and 2012 and they're still with us. So, first thing, one of the trade ideas that you will later see that I will present in this, in this presentation is going to be a recommendation to buy called diagonal spread. Before I get into that, I figured why not actually tell you what is called diagonal spread. Let's give a little bit of an education background here to begin with. A call diagonal spread is really just a variation of a covered call strategy. You basically swap the stock with long-term leap call options. And as a result, you reduce your cost and increase your yield, your percentage return on the trading, on the trade itself. It also gives you the luxury to be able to roll long-term call options as the stock continues to rise. You basically are buying high delta, long-term lead call options instead of the stock itself. And then each month you're selling short-term, out of money, low delta call option. And each time you do that, your goal is to basically bank 10 to 15% of the money that you paid to buy the long-term call option or potentially, hopefully, even more when, at the times when the implied volatility is high. So as a result, you're creating a structure that pays you dividends, which I call rent. Why not collect rent against your asset? And that's what it does, except a call diagonal spread gives you a higher yield, a percentage return, than a covered call will give. The two most overlooked parts of doing a call diagonal spread is really this. It first, it turns the theta decay, also called time decay, in your favor. If the stock is just flat in a neutral market, your short call that is out of money is gradually evaporating and it's gonna go to zero. That's good for your position. And then once it's gone to zero, you've collected maximum gain, next month you can set an out of money call again, like collecting rent against your asset. The second most overlooked part, and this, is, this comes most difficult to many traders that are getting started, is implied volatility. During the time when there's a catalyst involved, such as earnings, FD announcement, or whatnot, the implied volatility in the front one tends to be very jacked up versus the historic volatility on the stock. After the catalyst is over, the IV and HV converge sharply. Basically, option premiums tend to be overly expensive because of the event risk. Once the event is gone, those premiums come down sharply. So you're better off in a diagonal spread having the longer dated calls that have lower IV or lower implied volatility to the point where it's closer to historic volatility and short the lag on in the front month out of money that has higher implied volatility. Let that basically come down, the front lag, after the event is over as much as possible. Hence the diagonal spread. This is what the structure typically looks like. You buy a longer dated, at the money or slightly in the money, higher delta call options, and you sell front month, out of money, higher volatility, implied volatility call options, creating a diagonal spread. Now let's take this to example. But before I get into this, we did a webinar with our clients back in December and then once again in January. We do it actually twice per week. But in this particular webinar, the two that I did, and one in December, one in January, what I suggested to all my clients is there are times in the market where the short-term gyrations and the volatility creates a very good incentive for sophisticated option traders to do as many calendars and diagonal spreads as possible to take advantage of elevated implied volatilities in the front month. I think we are possibly going into that period again. Recently, the S&P, as you can see in the chart, basically backed away from it, a very important resistance. If you go to the next chart, this is VIX. VIX has started to climb again. Now, I do not know whether we're gonna pull all the way back to retest the December lows, which is about 2,400 level, give or take a bit, you know, in the S&P 500 in index. So I do not know if that's gonna happen. Maybe it will happen more gradually this time than it will happen all of a sudden, like last time in December. 
Maybe we're going to have summer doldrums and markets just going to gradually just keep treading water to the downside, slowly and slowly. And by the time the weak seasonality is here in September and October, we'll have a complete retest of December lows. A lot of different scenarios can be come out. But what's important is that the VIX is starting to respond back to the upside as the market is backing away from its resistance. Why am I telling you all this? In light of the diagonal spread. I'm telling you all of this because you're going to see in many stocks and sectors, it's already happening as of last week, you're going to see the front week or front month implied volatilities will start to rise on a lot of sectors and stocks. Once again, because in this case, the broad market sell-off. So as a result, the best structures to follow would be those where you're holding long-term calls with lower volatility and just selling those out-of-money premiums each month, collecting that rent against your assets. This is how we profited tremendously. We had several trades going when the volatilities were high in December and January, and we're doing that, starting to do that again for our clients. A lot of diagonals and uh, calendar spreads as a result. So every trade idea that is issued in Jaguar goes through a very, very specific vetting process. This vetting process involves three parts, fundamentals, technicals, and unusual option activity. Repeat after me when I say this. It's very important. Fundamentals tell us what to buy. Technicals tell us when to buy. And option activity tell us how to buy. Fundamentals tell us? Technicals tell us? And option activity tell us? We have seen this over and over again. One of the things why our, our service was so successful when I was in Option Monster and then now, uh, and now in Jaguar, and why our returns are so high, and why there's always a consistency for the most part, because our process, basically what I'm here, here for is to show you the process of how we identify setups and trade ID. A process involves diligently following this three-prong approach. I have a great view on a stock. Fundamentally, I can make a very strong case for it. So now I know what to buy. But technically, if it's not going anywhere, nobody's discovering it. It's a dead stock. What's the point? What are you going to learn out of it if I just tell you I have a great stock, but it's not going anywhere? If I have a great stock that's growing sharply ups, up or down, but if it's going up sharply while the fundamentals are total crap or going the other way, why would I want you to risk in that position? That's when the major corrections take place. Ultimately, realities catch up. Option activity, if I tell you that somebody is putting a million dollars online to buy call options, should you just go and jump in the pond because somebody else is? No. Only when all three come together in a beautiful, nice package, all three critical ingredients come together. You're served with a beautiful platter with steak, and now you can enjoy it. That's when the high conviction, that's when the conviction rates go up sharply and your win to loss ratios goes up sharply. Now you have a great stock, what to buy. You have technicals perfectly aligned with it. The stock is running, momentum behind it, people are buying it, trust behind it. And you've got institutions getting involved buying up call options in this. Great, what better could you ask for? Go in. And then you use the chart to basically figure out where you should put a stop loss. Three-prong approach, every single thing. Fundamentals, technicals, and unusual option activity. So, first trade. I said I brought a couple few trades for you guys to look at. We're going to use this three-prong approach on this particular stock. And at the end of the day, the at the end of this discussion, the trade recommendation I'm going to make will be based on call diagonal spread, which I just gave you the reasons why. Dr. Sign. How many of you are familiar with this? Probably a lot, right? Yeah. If you're in real estate, you probably are very familiar with this. This is the e-signature leader. The e-signature market is estimated by JP Morgan to be about $24 billion. But only 10% of that in the real estate where the biggest use of DocuSign is, is penetrated. Overall, in the entire world, less than 5% of 
the papers where a signature is involved is used electronically, is done electronically. So the total market penetration is only 5% of the $24 billion total addressable market size. DocuSign is the leader in the space with a commanding market share. The second biggest company after DocuSign in terms of market share is Adobe. DocuSign is five times bigger than Adobe. That's how far the number two, the number one, the number two are in this position. And then Adobe is six times bigger than the third guy in line. So DocuSign, the absolute leader in this space, there's no question about it. On December 20th, a congressman from a Democratic Party in California proposed a bill, short form IDEA, I-D-E-A. It was proposed in front of, uh, in front of the, uh, the president, and the president passed it into law on December 20th. This is called the 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act. I'll get into it in just a moment, what it does. There's a big technical breakout that took place in January from the base, and the stock continues to rise, currently forming a bull flag, and there's a gap fill coming up. We'll show the chart. An unusual option activity. We continue to see heavy leap call accumulation taking place out in January 2020 month. Fundamentals, technicals, unusual option activity. Always follow the same three-prong approach. So here is that IDEA Act that was passed on December 20th. Now, what does it exactly really do? You'd be surprised how backward is their federal or state governments, if you ever have to deal with any of them. You know, hope you don't have to. But if you do, you'll be find out that they're literally living still in the 18th or 19th century. Everything is paper, hard signatures required on everything, okay? All the big giant file cabinets are used to file all the important paperwork. Nobody remembers anything where these files are, none of that. So there is now finally a plan in play, pushed by Democrats from California, and that's how this law was passed called IDEA, to modernize the entire federal government. Everything, every branch, everything. And that requires a lot of electronic filing, a lot of track and keep of e-signatures everywhere. And that is started with that passing of the legislature on December 20th. It also requires that a lot of the federal agencies will now maintain mobile as well as proper websites for all the information and everything. This is a major growth driver for DocuSign. A significant amount of CapEx investment is now occurring starting from the beginning of this year from the federal government, and it will continue for the next six to seven quarters. There is this plan out there, without going too much into the detail, a significant portion of this investment has to come to end by the election time 2020, presidential election time. DACU is going to be the major beneficiary of that. You know, previously, when you think about what DACU, how you do it, you basically create a form, you print it, you take it to the guy who needs to sign it, he signs it, he puts in a snail mail, and then the snail mail goes, and then it gets filed away. What a such a boring and such a lousy system that was. And now multiply that by, this is just an example of a business. How many agreements are signed, or parties, or co-signatures, or all kinds of agreements, collaborations, par you know, are created on a daily basis in a typical business? Within sales, sales ordering processing, customer account, provisioning, marketing services, human resources, hiring, firing, finance, IT operations, legal, you can just go on and on and on. Agreements, agreements everywhere. All of that needs to be modernized to the point where everything is not only has e-signatures, but also properly filed in the cloud with tracking mechanisms so everybody knows, the central system, nervous system, or the business knows exactly where they are at any given time. Look at the opportunity here, with only 5% market penetration in the market. So DocuSign has this robust technology to get us there. Without going into the detail, there's a picture that shows you exactly how it all happens. From creating online forms, I'm sure if you bought ever a real estate and if, you were, if your realtor was you know, already adopted to the 21st century, I'm sure you've seen those e-signature tags, right? 
on the forms that your realtor sent, like just put your signatures there, all electronically. I sold my house in Chicago a couple of years ago without ever, being in, that, without ever going into the meeting. The whole thing was done electronically that way. So everything is, and then not only it keeps tracks of who signed the signatures, whether the, whether the requirements are fulfilled, and it keeps the management informed, but it also nicely files these forms on the cloud. The whole system, papers are gone completely, and this is what the future will do. So many large companies are already part of this. They're using DocuSign. 10 of the top 15 global financial services companies, including Bank of America, Charles Schwab, everybody who uses DocuSign. Seven of the top 10 technology companies and 18 of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies. They're all customers of DocuSign. Strong growth, take a look at those growth rates from fiscal year 2017 to 2018. Remarkable growth on every single category, and this is the industry leader. Now, what's important in this chart when you're looking at it is that none of that came from federal government, all from private enterprises. Now you have a kicker with the law passed in December. Now the federal government will also become a large part of this. Take a look at the total number of customers that continue to rise every single year at a nice steady rate as well as total enterprise and commercial customers as well. Now here's a chart. That was all fundamentals. Here's a chart. Take a look closely at this chart. It broke out from the base back in December and January. First focus on this, most importantly. Notice that in December when the entire market was crashing, and all the technicals, you guys know the S&P, all the technicals, everybody was basically, every stock was making new 52-week low, taking, breaking down through their October and November lows. This one did not. Relative outperformance, relative strength. This wasn't breaking down in December. It was, it was pulling back, but it had this relative strength behind it. The stock is in a strong hands. That's what it was telling you. And then as the market recovered, it came back sharply. Now my interest over here is that there is a VOP volume over price resistance that is coming up at this level around 57.50. There's a bull flag formation here. If it breaks out through this, there's a gap that remains to be filled that was left behind in September. And that gap is all the way up to 62.50. So I'm looking for a move, a breakout through 57.50 and a move to 62.50, five dollars to the upside on a percentage basis where the stock is trading right now is about 11, 12%. This is a picture from Jaguar Scan where we basically watch all the option order flows that come into the picture. And it is showing very high 90% bullish bias. We look at all the option order flows that come through the option market, we break it out between buyers and sellers and we really focus on where the conviction levels is very high. The option market is telling us there's a very high bullish bias. I can tell you about $1.2 million worth of leap call options were also recently acquired. So here's the trade. Fundamentals, check. Technicals, check. Option market, check. The diagonal spread, why am I doing diagonal spread in this case? I'm doing diagonal spread because the earnings are coming out actually this week on March 14th. What is it? I think it's Thursday. I think it's Thursday after market close, but could be before market opens. We have to check on that. But I know it's on March 14th. So the implied volatility is a little bit jacked up in the front two months. So I'm looking for a breakout, so I would like to go out to June and buy the 57.5 call options simply because it has lower IV, which is closer to historic volatility. And I would like to sell the April 62.5 calls. Why 62.5? because that's my target, uh, technically on the stock, as I showed in the chart earlier. The spread will cost you about $3.50, a $5 spread, but it will convert the theta decay or time decay in your favor, as well as the crush, the implied volatility crush that will happen once the event is over. If for some reason trade doesn't work out, April goes away, then you can sell May, out of money call options and juice more returns against your June calls. Remember, pay yourself rent against your asset. And it continues to be, if the stock rips higher, goes to your target 62.50, that 350 will probably go to 5, 550, take profits a step aside.
targeted seed. Yes. They will not recheck their expectation. There was a recently, there was a channel check that was provided by Citigroup Research, I think it was two days ago, three days ago. We focus very closely on channel checks, mid-quarter channel checks, which seems to suggest whether the momentum is still in place going into earnings or not. Oftentimes, we follow that lead to find out. It doesn't really necessarily just come from Citigroup. It comes from all kinds of analysts and some of our own too in-house. And so these channel checks were telling us that they, are, that they believe that the quarter will sustain the same kind of growth momentum at around 35% year over year than what we have seen previously. There has been no dislocation in the business of any kind. And why is volatility so high? That always, volatility is always high around earnings, around any kind of events. It's always checked up because it's a particular event. Of all. I'll get to more questions. I, I let me go through the presentation and then we'll get to that. Okay, ready for the next trade idea? Verizon, what a boring stock. Why am I bringing this? <laughs> who cares? Exactly, nailed it, who was it? <laughs> right there. Let me tell you the story about 5G, but hopefully it will make sense. Verizon, I believe, has 40 to 50% upside in the stock in the next two years. You will not hear anybody else say that. So buy this for 5G because you're at the cusp of a massive, massive telecom capex cycle that is just getting started. 5G was rolled out by Verizon in only two cities at the end of 2018, LA, and then I believe there was another California city where they were testing it. Now there's a hyper growth rate that is coming, rollout happening throughout the entire country. Apple hasn't even announced a 5G phone yet, and I hope they're smart enough to beat the Samsung and have an Apple, an iPhone 5G phone out this fall. If they don't, Apple is gonna lose market share badly to Samsung and everybody else. But Verizon and AT&T and others are now waiting for Apple to release a phone yet. They're already starting to basically prepare for the massive, massive CapEx spending cycle that is coming up. So, same exact thing, fundamentals, technicals, and option activities. We're gonna follow the same exact thing. All right, three-prong approach. Here's what 5G does. Pretty much tells you. Imagine downloading an HD full-length movie on your cell phone, using your cell phone signal in three seconds or less. That's what 5G is. We're gonna fly literally with this, with the speed. And if you have not seen it tested, you'll be surprised how fast this thing is. It's nuts. And this is the building block for the future developments of many impressive, really great technologies that have yet to come to the market. You need an infrastructure in place, the whole skeleton in place that you can use to build upon future technologies. What technologies am I talking about? Driverless. Connected cars, driverless cars, connected cars, industrial automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, and a lot of these applications possible right from your phone. That's what 5G is going to do because 5G's latency is one-tenth of 4G, but 5G's speed is 20 gigabytes per second versus one, or per minute, one second, one second. <laughs> 20 versus one for 4G. It's 20 times faster than 4G. It is the biggest bull market and we're at the beginning phase of it there. I don't think honestly in the stock market today there is any other sector or industry where you're gonna see more dramatic rise in CapEx than the telecom CapEx, capital expenditure that means. Verizon is already committing to that. All of you are gonna start seeing commercials on TV, 5G, 5G, 5G. Now let me ask you a question. Maybe you've pondered about this, maybe you haven't paid thought about this. I asked my clients this question a couple of weeks ago, got some fun answers to talk about. Many years ago, broadband killed dial-up. 
Remember dial-up? Oh, that funny sound you used to make? Many years ago, broadband killed dial-up. Will 5G kill broadband? Think of it this way. You have a smart TV at home, you watch Netflix on it. Maybe you have an Xbox, you play these high quality you know, g games or whatnot. And it's all connected to your broadband at home, whatever it is, Comcast, Time Warner, doesn't really matter. But your cell phone signal is giving you 20 gigabytes, which is 20 times faster than your broadband connection coming at home. Do you really need internet at home anymore? When if you can have every kind of device, IoT, remember Internet of Things, connected to your cell phone connection at a speed that is 20 times faster than what your broadband is. Is Comcast dead? Time Warner, Charter Communications, all these other cable companies? Maybe, we just don't know, right? Comcast did kill America online, remember that, AOL? We'll find out in time. Take a look at the 5G growth that is coming your way. Only 400,000 of all the US mobile users will have a 5G mobile device in their hands by the middle of 2019, so summer 2019. And then it's gonna expand to 14 million. Actually, let me correct that, that's not 400,000, that's four million. Then it's gonna jump to 14 million by 2020, 88 million, 138 million, and it's just gonna basically go skyrocket from here. These are devices, these are connections, these are not populations. To get there, here is a snapshot of a presentation that I gave to my clients about three weeks ago. I don't know if you can see over this or not, but in this presentation I wanted to show the slide of how AT&T by the end of 2018 had already entered into 12 markets with 5G. Verizon only four, T-Mobile 30, and Sprint only six. The whole country is still open for all of them. To do this, CapEx is going to rise sharply, capital expenditures. This is a commitment of the 5G CapEx commitment from the entire telecom sector. Look at the progression that is taking place. Now think about all the companies like Sienna that makes the equipment, that networking equipment, symbol C-I-E-N, or Enersys, symbol E-N-S, that makes the boxes that goes on the trees as well as the, 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 the poles where the 5G connection will be all made possible. Or think about Crown Castle that makes a small cell, symbol C-C-I, that makes these a small cell that made these connections possible. All of these companies are beneficiaries of these and it's gonna come straight down from both AT&T, Verizon, and everybody else. Now here's something interesting, the next chart. Why do I care about the CapEx? Let's connect the dots over here. This is a Verizon 10-year chart. The last cycle, CapEx cycle, was, from, was for 4G and it went from 2010 to 2013. Look at the returns of Verizon then. And then the CapEx died because everybody had 4G by the time 2013 was here. So Verizon went from spending tremendous amount of money to what they call consumption years. Now just sit on it, get fat, just enjoy the fat return. Stock died basically, not, didn't do anything for a good five years, six years. And now a brand new CapEx cycle has started, which is 5G. And I don't think it's gonna stop until the stock goes, it's probably gonna continue until 2021, 2022 at minimum. Because all these applications I talked about, connected car, robotics, industrial automation, AI, VR, uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, all of them, there's so many great things coming that you haven't even seen yet, that you haven't even observed yet. What your cell phones, what your mobile devices, what would be possible in the future? But first, the infrastructure has to be built first, and that's 5G. Here's a short-term chart of Verizon. Recently, it broke out to a downtrending resistance, and in the last couple of days, it has pulled back slightly and is retesting that support. This is where the buying opportunity comes in. You're getting the opportunity after the breakout, a minor pullback and a retest of the trend resistance. From here, I think the stock is going to take a next leg higher. Here's what the option activity looks like from Jaguar scans. 
75% almost bullish bias, according to Jaguar scans, taking a look at last two months of option order flows. That big green bar that you see in the center is when we saw large bulls stepped in in June call options. This was a couple of weeks ago. So here's the trade. Now in this particular case, I don't want to do spreads. Verizon is usually doesn't have very high implied volatility. It's a 200 some billion dollar company. It's got very liquid options and it's easy trade. Also, I do not want to do short term calls in this one because you need to let the 5G theme sort of play out gradually and then you will have plenty of opportunities to roll these call options once the, starts, once the stock starts to run in your favor. To buy, the trade is to buy straight October 57.5 calls for 250 or less. I'm looking for a move all the way up to 59.60 in the stock by then. Once it gets there, these calls will have doubled and you can roll them up to January 2020 60 strike call options. And stay with the trend, don't give up. As the stock keeps going up, you just keep rolling these calls. Higher strike and outer months. Stay with the trend for the next several years. And that's the play over here on Verizon. So, is everything just bullish or are we gonna be shorting something too? Are there short opportunities? We go both ways. Up and down, there are two sides of the market. One needs to learn how to skate forward and backward. Yes, we have a lot of shorts too. I'm gonna fly through these real quick instead of presenting you actual discussion points. CarMax, we believe the stock is heading down. We believe that the USR, the, US, the total number of new vehicles that are sold in the country, the USR has recently pulled back from 17.3 million cars to 16.6 million. We believe the USR will continue to come down even more. Partly driven by macro deterioration in the data points that you're seeing, partly also driven by long term, the autonomous driving that is coming to the market. We believe the USR for several quarters will continue to come down. The total number of new vehicle sales is bearish for the entire auto complex. CarMax is where we currently have put options and the stock is starting to break down. XOP, this is the shale gas producers ETF. We are also short this one right now. We have put options in this. We believe that the crude oil inventory which went up by almost 50 million barrels in Cushing, Oklahoma in the aftermath when 200 billion tariffs were announced in China in September, they're not coming down. We believe there's, they're still gonna go higher. And as the inventory levels go higher, it puts a pressure on crude oil price. The risk to this trade is that there could be a large deal with China but it, it just seems like it's a can that just keeps getting pushed out further and further. We have no idea when it's gonna happen. Until then, crude oil inventory is going up and that's bearish for crude oil and XOP and all the shale gas producers are coming down. So we're short this too. Dish Networks, we're short this one too. We have put options in this one. By the way, there's a big battle going on between Dish Network and HBO. HBO has pulled the plug on Dish Network. Actually, the battle is really between HBO and Time Warner, and Dish is just tangled up in that. The problem with Dish Network is it keeps losing subscribers. They lost almost 400,000 subscribers last quarter, which was more than 300,000 subscribers they lost in the prior quarter. So why is HBO giving them more headache? HBO is only gonna make the situation worse because Game of Thrones season finale is starting in April, which I'm sure the whole country will be watching, and HBO does not have access, or Dish Networks does not have access to HBO anymore. So think about all those subscribers that want to watch Game of Thrones, but don't have access to it. So I think you're gonna see cancellation rate, churn rate on the company will go up even more. So we're looking for a breakdown in the trend support and a stock to move lower to new 52 week low. Nine years of performance record, 1,400 trade ideas, close, bought and close using the same exact three-prong approach that I just talked about. Average profit per trade, 34%. Average number of trades held, 47 days. Winning trades, 72%. Losing trades, 28%. That's my long-term record. You will have losers. If anybody tells you they will not have losers, then they're simply outright lying to you. I'm guaranteeing you, you will have losers. It's part of the game. 
Without losers, you don't learn, you don't improve. If you click on those links, it will take you to the full records of 2016, 2017, 2018, show you all the trade ideas we issued in those years in a nice PDF file. Open and closing prices, everything. Here's a performance of the last four years, you know. The portfolio was up 110% in 2016. Portfolio was up 217% in 2017. Even in the tough, difficult year like 2018, we were able to eke out gains by 30 some percent, and so far we're up 18% in 2019. Every single trade, this, this whole picture is made up of at least 400 trades. Every single take from buy end, from buy to sell entries, uh, advisories, all on the record, right on the website. Two kinds of subscription services we have on the website, a light and a pro. The light is $99 per month, the pro is $300 per month, or $299 per month. The biggest differences are, the pro comes with webinars twice per week, as well as a chat room where you can find me and my entire research team every single day from 8 o'clock in the morning or 8.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the evening. So chat room and webinars are the two biggest difference between the light and the pro. Otherwise, the actual official trade recommendations that go out, they're exactly the same in both. And this is what we have. The last slide for, the, for, this, for today. The limited offer we have is basically sign up for a four week trial for just 10 bucks. If you don't like it, zero obligations, nada nada, you can just go. If you like to stay, you have a choice to either stay as a light subscriber or a pro subscriber, whichever you guys, whichever you decide. After four week trial ends, you get 10% off. Use that code, make sure you have that code, NYTRADERS19. Use that code at the time when you're signing up for the trial. Try the entire service, the trial is for the full website, so that's the pro level subscription. And at the end of four weeks, if you don't wanna stay, you don't have to stay. If you do stay, choose, a, choose which subscription fits you and then get the 10% off. Okay, questions? I can only take a few, I think. Yes? Because there is a, that's a great question. The, the, one other thing is that March expiration is so close and the 62.5 strike is so far out that the total amount of premium I was able to get for selling it against June was, I was looking at it, it was like 30 cents, which didn't seem high enough to basically pay or compensate me for the risk I was taking holding June calls. But with April, at least, I'm getting a dollar for 05, which as a percentage of owning the June calls is almost like 25%. So it's really cutting my cost down by about 25%. So, and, and that's how it works. Hey, Tom. You get a hat for that. <laughs> so here's a, okay. One more, any questions? Yes. Oh, debt on the balance sheet? No, no, not really. Um, the debt is very cheap, the company that is acquired, the interest rates is extremely low. Um, and uh, most importantly, when the free cash flows start to rise dramatically with the 5G rollout, at the end, once the CapEx cycle starts to slow down and years out, the debt will look minuscule compared to, compared to what the future revenues will look like and the free cash flow position will look like, yes. We use a service called LiveVol, but there are many other kind of subscription services that you can basically use. What we have done is we have used LiveVol and then we basically create a tremendous amount of filters that scan the data the way we want to look at to only screen the activities that are important to us from positioning standpoint. And then on top of it, we built our Jaguar scanner that, is allow that allows subscribers to see you know, what the bullish or the bearish bias is and so on. Um, yeah, yeah, it's all on the website, it's part of your subscription, you can just go into Jaguar scan, you can type in any symbol and just look at any kind of, you can drill it down to the point of exactly when the trade went off 
what day, what price they paid, how many contracts they bought, every single detail. You can look at it on any stock at any time. Intraday in the Jaguar scan? It's not live yet, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that, in fact, just when I was in the plane coming in yesterday, we were talking about this. We need to make this streaming. Right now, it's updated one, once a day at the end when the market is closed, and then we basically download the entire API data. We update the scans. But our plan is already in place how to make this streaming and make it live. It's coming soon. All right. Uh, time is up. I'm sorry, the, oh yes, yeah, so, so the Jaguar scan, you can, we have, we have built four ways of uh, scanning the data already. One is by symbol, one is by expiration date, one is by sector, and um, one is by just the top, top 10 to 20, you know, bullish and various positions that are taking place at any given time. So we've already, made the filters readily available for you to use at any time. And you can just follow those and basically find out where the action is in the option market. Let me put it this way. Interestingly, so many questions around Jaguar scan, I wasn't anticipating that. Um, there's about 24 million option contracts are traded in every single day in the option market. Try figuring out how, which one to focus or what the heck is going on, it's gonna drive you crazy. So several numbers of filters and scanners have been created to come up with a graphically present, uh, a graphically way of presenting you exactly where the action is and what to focus on. That's what Jaguar scan is. It filters it down to the level where it becomes actionable. You don't want to look at all the noise that is happening in the option market. Just only focus on the one where the action is worthy of attention. Yeah, so we have a boot on the floor, uh, boot number 220. You can come to the boot. The, the hall opens tonight, and then we'll be there all day tomorrow as well as on uh, Tuesday. And we have a monitor over there where we'll, we're going to make a presentation about what Jaguar Scan does al as lo al along with it, many of the things that we do basically on the website. So any more questions on that, the m best way to find out. Any more questions? Uh, Verizon, Sienna, C-I-E-N, C-C-I, Crown Castle. Those are three the best at this moment, I believe. Enersys, E-N-S. E-N-S makes the, the wiring and the equipment that goes, that is basically uh, used to put these uh, devices for 5G connectors, essentially, from one tree to another tree, from one pole to another pole, especially in big metropolitan areas. Symbol ENS. That stock is a little bit wobbly right now with the market sell-off because it's seen in the uh, as an industrial mostly, and also the company has yet to prove that it is seeing a lot of benefits coming from the higher capex from Verizon. But the ones that are working right now for 5G, the ones that are clearly is Verizon itself, Sienna, and CCI. Those three are the best. Yes. What could go wrong? Uh, you know. Here's something that could go wrong. Um, I don't want to turn this into political debate, but US and China is a threat, the whole trade discussions. Could it have an impact on CapEx environment? I think it could. Trump even jokingly threw an idea out uh, the other day, which I heard that he wants to nationalize 5G. I don't know if you guys heard that or not. I don't know. But I think if there's any, I don't think there's many threats to be on because this is a powerful wave coming with many people that are expected to benefit from it. Um, and so I, I don't think there is really much disruptions on our way. The only things I can think of is potential government interruption of some kind or maybe some US-China deal that falls apart and the next thing we know it doesn't really matter because the market mood is off and everything is just coming down sharply, which is what we saw basically in the aftermath of 200 billion in tariffs in the fourth quarter. So that would be the biggest risk, geopolitical risk. Aside from that, I'm not too concerned about 5G. 
No, Apple has not made a 5G phone. Samsung only announced it like literally two weeks ago when they created with the foldable phone. You guys probably saw the pictures. And then after that, Huawei in China announced it within a couple days after that. Nobody has it yet. There's not a single 5G phone in the market. Even the one that Samsung announced is not going to be released until June. So you're in the early, early cycle over here. I bet, yes, yes. Huawei is not going to be sold in the U.S. Um, so. Intercept? I've never even heard of it. Oh, Intelsat. Could, but uh, I need to do some research on this to, con to be able to connect the dots to 5G. Please let me know if I have to stop here at some point. Uh, but uh, Intelsat is a different animal. It's not exactly that. And recently the stock sold off very sharply too for other reasons completely dis un other than 5G. So a little bit more difficult to connect the dots there with 5G. Uh, I think the best plays, the ones that are going to be the biggest beneficiaries are going to be all the tower stocks, CCI, AMT, and SBAC. I saw a hand over there. Nope. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to stop over here. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please come and see us at the booth on the main floor. Thank you.